we'll just wait for people to join in and then I'll get started. We already have people joining in. Mm -hmm. We can start in a minute. Uh, hello, friends. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, it, today's webinar is brought to you in association with Beyond Food Waste. And uh, we're going to discuss a new model for urban food waste collection, breaking down barriers. We have Kat Heinrich, who's a director at RawTech. She's the moderator of today's webinar. If you haven't seen other webinars she's moderated, please head to the video panel section of our website, or you could go to the uh, moderators page on our website and you will have access to them. And she's going to talk to Daniel Langeberg, who's a founder and CEO of EcoCaddy. And uh, just a few admin related uh, things, and then I hand it over to Kat. We have received uh, quite a few questions from the registrants in advance, which have been passed on to both the speakers today. And Kat will weave them into the conversation. And any other questions you have, please use the QA section, and she will bring it up as and when relevant. Over to you, Kat. Thanks, Rita, for the introduction. Um, so as Rita mentioned, my name is Kat Hyman, I'm a principal consultant and director at Vortec. Um, and we're based in South Australia, which is also where Daniel um, Langeberg is joining us today. Um, this webinar is part of a series that we've been running together with Heis Langeberg, Langeberg through um, the Beyond Food Waste Initiative, which is looking at sharing best practice in food waste management around the globe. So if anyone's interested, there's a whole range of previous webinars that we've done together with Be Waste Wise that you can check out on our website or the Be Waste Wise website. And it's my pleasure today to be able to um, moderate this webinar about new models for urban food waste collections and breaking down the barriers. Um, as many of you may have experienced, which is probably why you're joining us today, it is really challenging to get good source separation and collection of food waste in urban environments. And there are particular challenges with some of the smaller food waste generators like cafes and restaurants. So today we're gonna to be unpacking some of these challenges. And we're gonna be hearing from Daniel Lundberg about his new innovative model for collecting food waste from these types of organizations and understanding how that's overcoming some of the barriers. Um, and so Daniels, I'd like to introduce Daniel. So as Sweeza mentioned, he is the CEO and founder of, of Eco Caddy. Um, very well, warm welcome to you, Daniels. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Sweeza. How are you going, <laughs> so, everyone? Yes, welcome, everyone. I should say a shout out to our audience today as well. So we've got people joining us um, from the US, UK, Europe, Australia, India, and a few um, people from countries in Africa. Um, so I imagine some of you will be joining us live if the time zone works, and others, others may be catching up later on this recording. Um, so just to, to jump in, um, Daniels, um, to get started, can you describe what the Eco Caddy model is for food waste collection? Yeah, sure thing, Kat. So Eco Caddy, we're actually a micro mobility company, um, and uh, the collection of food scraps or uh, you know organic uh, waste is relatively new for us. So we've been around for about eight years um, and we've been doing, we've been in this space for about 12 months. Um, very exciting to be in this space. Um, our core functionality as a company is, is a logistics company. So we, we move people. Um, that's, that's how we were born as a, as a micro mobility company around short distances, trying to solve last mile, first mile uh, problems in dense urban environments, mainly cities in Australia. Um, and, then we started to do parcels, um, food uh, here in Adelaide, uh, and then, yeah, now into, into food waste collection. So we are, uh, when we're in this space, I suppose you could define us as a micro hauler. Um, this is a term that's, uh, you know, very popular in Europe and the United States. Um, and it's certainly where we were inspired to go, oh, look, we could actually uh, do something like that. We think that that's a fantastic way to solve uh, one of these, you know, wicked problems um, that's out there in the world. So... That's, uh, yeah, that's EcoCaddy's organic model at the moment. Can you break down, uh, so from a customer perspective, if you're a restaurant or cafe, how, how does the EcoCaddy model work from their perspective? Yeah, so um, from launch, we really wanted to solve problems for customers that we identified having the, uh, probably the largest pain points um, and ones that we thought uh, would work with our model of service. So it's a, 
it's a high service model, high touch service model. Um, and what we've looked to do is to uh, essentially overcome uh, a few a few problems, which I'm sure um, the audience uh, would be aware of. One of them is access, so access to food service businesses. It's a really nuanced space, um, particularly in the last 20 meters um, where you know you actually have to get that, you have to retrieve that bin or that container uh, and empty it. Um, and so we were actually doing something very different, which is as a micro mobility company, we were uh, moving around electric scooters for uh, these uh, these e-scooter companies and e-mobility companies. We got pretty good at that. It was like uh, playing Pokemon Go. Uh, we'd find these uh, we'd find these scooters all around the city in various places, um, and we got really good at that. And our unit economics uh, were, were pretty good. And we thought, well, what else can we do uh, which makes an impact? And that's how we landed sort of on organics. But for the customer, what they get is um, they get a turnkey service. So we then sort of took it further and we're like, okay, it's not just a bin access issue. There's when we actually get into the space, when we get into the kitchens, there's a whole other logistics pattern that's happening there. And you've got chefs and waitresses and waiters, you know, all having to move these objects around this very intense uh, in, uh, environment, high speed environment. And so we thought if we can come into that kitchen and, uh, and drop a, a fresh bin uh, uh, for a, a full bin, uh, and provide a service where that bin is cleaned, it's skinned, uh, and it's dropped in the exact same location. That takes that work uh, out from from that environment, and that that uh, customer doesn't have to deal with it anymore. So you have training issues. There's a whole bunch of issues there. We we identified about 20 problems in that space, and there's more. There's a lot more, um, but we focused on about 20. And then when we got outside of that space, there was about four or five that we thought uh, we could solve with the vehicle that we've got, and that was around access. And not having a bin sitting outside, so we we spoke with Adelaide City Council, uh, and they've got contested space, which is curbside space. So there's no space for another bin, and that was one of the barriers why these businesses aren't actually uh, taking up organics. So that's how we've yeah. solved that. Yeah. Yeah. So just just for the benefit of the audience, to give a bit of context about South Australia and and Adelaide, so. Um, a conventional model for collecting source separated food waste would be to collect it into a realist bin, like a bin on, on four wheels, um, and for a realist collection vehicle to um, collect, you know, that, that bin either from the curb, curb or the back of the property and, and lift that bin into the back. And then it would be up to the restaurant or the cafe staff to, to make sure to manage that in-house um, food waste system to, to sort the food waste into compostable bags or whatever units they're using. And then to place it in there, we might have been on collection day, it gets emptied by the truck, etc. Um, which is, is a very effective uh, service and works well in, in lots of scenarios. Um, but the, one of the challenges, as, as Daniel was just talking about before, is um, particularly in, in high density urban environments, it, sometimes it's really hard to even get a truck into um, these properties. So through my work at Rawtech, we've, we've worked a lot with developers and architects and and sometimes the vertical clearance is a challenge, um, you know, not being able to get a truck in. Sometimes there's no space, so loading zone, et cetera, um, to, to pull in. So that, yeah, your model of, of, of just um, having a smaller um, uh, vehicle to come and collect that waste is, is helping overcome that. I'm just thinking, um, Daniel, yeah. maybe it's worth me sharing a picture of your, I'll share my screen, and maybe you can talk us through the, this is from your website of, of the, yeah. the vehicle itself. Yeah, so it, it would be very hard to describe. I'm glad that you put a picture up, Kat. Um, you know, it's worth a thousand words and we, we don't have that much time. Um, so yeah, what you're looking at is a electric assist uh, tricycle. Um, and we, we do have various modules that we can put on the back of where Lewis, our rider is here. Um, so, you know, it can be in a pedicab configuration where we can take uh, two people uh, thanks for putting up our link, Swetha. Um, yeah, and so in in this in this instance, uh, we've hitched a trailer, an articulated trailer, which we've we've built, um, and we've created this system, uh, which enables us to have a, a rack of containers, um, which then you know sort of what you're looking at there is about 300 kilos of cargo or payload, um, and this enables us to get in very close to where we're collecting. The business, as you can see, is at the back there. Um, and, and that little uh, sort of black uh, doorway uh, behind the containers, that's actually where we're going into. And so that's the contested space. When you go in there, it's a, it's a corridor of all these bins and cardboard and 
Uh, and what's interesting is that that's also the place where the customers from that business have to go through to, to access the toilet. And so it's, it's a huge issue when you're talking about public liability, um, whereby, you know, you get one bad actor that's, uh, you know, putting something, uh, a potential obstacle, which then a customer trips over uh, and breaks their ankle, then, you know, who pays for that? So for landlords and property owners, uh, we're a breath of fresh air because essentially we're taking out uh, another liability out of that uh, highly contested space and putting it into the actual tenancy where um, obviously, you know, it can be controlled. So yeah, it's a, uh, it's a great vehicle. It's very maneuverable. Uh, it can turn around uh, in less than a car lane. Uh, you can actually, because of the way that we've designed the articulated trailer, uh, it can, it can basically do a, a 160 degree turn. So it can turn the front wheel all the way to the back wheel and, 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 it, and it doesn't jackknife. So it's very maneuverable. Uh, and we can get it in, uh, like um, Kat was saying, in places where trucks can't. This is a very small laneway as well. This is about, uh, I think it's about 3.2 metres wide, this laneway. Uh, and when we park this trike where Lewis has parked it, cars can actually get past us. So we can actually uh, stop on the side of the road or on the footpath if we require. Um, and, and we're not actually congesting. We're not holding up traffic, which is another real bugbear of these large trucks uh, that are coming into the space. The other is noise. And then lastly, odour. Um, so these are, are sealed bins. Um, we're lifting them on a daily basis before decomposition starts to take place. And I can talk about the whole host of problems there. I'm sure the audience knows them. But, you know, you're talking about rodents. Uh, you're talking about all sorts of vermin uh, that are getting uh, into that space. And, uh, and then just the, just the experience of the space being uh, somewhat... Um, adversely impacted by smell which is not what you want when you're you've spent so much time as a business owner to get good smells coming out of your property so um yeah that's these are the sort of nice to have that came along with this system that we designed those containers at the back of the eco caddy are they the same containers that go back in house or are there different containers back of house that you empty into these larger containers on the caddy they're the same yeah so um what, what we really looked at was how we can uh, make it easy and make it a very, um, uh, yeah, very palatable proposition for uh, the owners particularly, but also chefs that we're bringing in another object into that very small uh, space, which, you know, comes at a premium. Um, and we're talking about our health safety as well. So uh, most chefs have got it all laid out. Um, in where they, they put these things. And so what we ultimately did when we were designing the system was how can we put containers in there that can replace a Slim Jim, uh, you know, which is a, a pretty popular um, size bin that, uh, that you'll see back of house in kitchens. And so mm -hmm. these are slightly wider, um, but they're shallower. So the other thing is that we need to be able to carry them out, which you can't do with a Slim Jim of 60 litres. You're looking at over 30 kilos of weight um, and so we broke that up in the vertical access and made them stackable. So, um, yeah, the container was pretty important um, to the whole system in portability and, uh, and, and getting it into that kitchen space. So I might just stop sharing my screen now. Um, so whereabouts do you find your customers are finding that these, these containers um, should fit to be most effective? Like, are, are the kitchen staff putting them where they're scraping off the plates from the, you know, back from the customers or are the chefs putting them like at the end of their preparation area? Like where, where do you find people are, are you putting them within back of house? Again, it's, it is nuanced. Like every space is slightly different. Um, but we think that placing them. So what, what we, what we did was we said, what is the, uh, the path of least resistance to get in with the customer and to get them to change, right? We're talking about, behavioral change here um, in a place uh, which is, has a high turnover of staff as well. So, you know, training people in a system, you really want to be able to conform to an existing system. Um, and so we said, okay, well, where, where are we getting the vast quantity of, um, of, of, you know, volume of scraps? And that's really where uh, the production kitchen is. So working with the chefs and replacing one of their bins to start off with, and then another one of their bins. And then lastly, um, yeah, moving to where, you know, the dish you might be with off the plate. That's um, sort of how we do it in terms of our phasing. Um, and then, you know, I think the other thing is like, don't go too hard, too fast. Don't expect them to change overnight. So, you know, really it's about 
getting your key players in that space, chefs, sous chefs, um, maitre d's, uh, you know, these are the these are the champions in that space. The owner obviously ultimately signs off on the stuff, but they're not the ones that implement it and enforce it every single day. So finding the champions within that space and really working with them and going, look, this is, we've thought about this. I'm an ex-hospitality worker, worker. I've worked in hospitality for 12 years, sold most of my staff. Um, and so we know that space really well and we know how to move in that space. So when we get in and we get out, it's like an it's like we're invisible. That's sort of what we're trying to do. We're not getting in anyone's way. And we also know that we're, there's a certain flow in those spaces and we don't want to impede that flow. We want to be a part of that flow. So we did a lot of work in that um, area uh, when we were designing the system. Right. And um, describe to me some of the conversations you would have. So if you, if you approached a, a new business, like a cafe or a restaurant, and you said, look, we've got this model, what kind of conversations are you having with the, the owners or the back of house to kind of bring them on board? Are they, is it easy to sell this type of service or are they just, um, yeah, are they receptive or do you have to do a lot of convincing? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely reception there. Um, I think in Adelaide, uh, there's a there's a real appetite to be um, doing things that are better for the planet here. Um, I think that uh, we have a, a very good recycling program here. Um, you know, Jeffries is a household name. Pete's is a, uh, a a household name. You see their trucks everywhere, and everyone um, does their best, particularly with recycling plastic as well. So I don't think it's a hard sell to recycle uh, and the benefits of recycling. Um, I think really more so it's around the education of how bad um, it is when food goes into landfill. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that. What's interesting is that, um, sure, when we first came um, out in this space uh, and we started talking with owners, they were like, hang on, we know EcoCaddy, why are you in this space? So we had to convince them that we um, could do what we said we could do. Um, and that really is a, is a reliability conversation, scale conversation, which we've proven. Uh, time and time again but um a lot of it is actually organic um you know pun intended i suppose um in that uh, there's a strong push from staff that can see the waste you know these these new uh, waiters and waitresses they come in and they go this is gross how much food is being thrown out um i'm not comfortable with this and that conversation happens internally chefs are aware of this as well customers are aware of this and so really there's a pressure that's coming from both sides, both customers and staff on owners to do a better thing. Um, and you can't hide this stuff because you can smell it. So, you know, <laughs> the conversation, the conversation for us is, um, you know, we sort of come in and we say, look, um, do you have these problems? We validate that they've got those issues around space that they've, uh, they haven't tried it before or they have tried it. And there's been certain drawbacks to when they have tried it. Uh, and we then show them the solution that we've got. Um, and then, yeah, and then they just trial it with us for for a week. Um, and then it moves very quickly into a paid service uh, because they're, they're pretty satisfied with it. So. Okay, so you do a free trial for a week and then if they like it, they can continue for a paid service. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, used to trial it. we used to trial it for longer. Um, I think it's, you know, the try before you buy um, mm -hmm. it, or the freemium model, the Netflix model. Um, everyone's pretty... Everyone's pretty aware of that. Um, it is expensive from a customer acquisition point of view, um, yeah. but for us, it's about long-term relationships. So we'd rather try it for a week um, and actually see how the customer goes. Uh, there, are, there are good and bad customers in every space. Um, we really wanna be working with customers that really wanna do this properly. Um, and so set them up for success. And if we don't see that after a week on both sides and you know, we part, but more often than not, um, that relationship continues. Okay. Uh, it's interesting, you know, your, your earlier point, you were saying how um, the, the staff are nearly disgusted about how much food waste there is. Um, just, just curious about whether when restaurants start to actually sort food waste back of house away from their other materials, whether they become, in your experience, whether you're seeing them become more aware of their, the amount of food waste they're generating and whether or not that then leads to behaviour change in terms of looking internally within their operations on how they can reduce and prevent that food waste from being generated in the first place. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think is a short answer to that. Um, you know, the, the core of what we're doing, and we said this to ourselves before we stepped into this space, like when I was talking to my team, was like, 
we're not a waste company. Like we uh, never want to be a waste company. We don't see it as waste um, as I think a lot of people in this audience. I think it's an old word, you know, it's a, um, it's, it's really a resource and uh, it's a, you know, it's a source of energy. It's a source of nutrients. And I think that's, what's going to change ultimately in the future. Um, and the customers, that is the end users actually getting them to see it in the first instance, when you divert that, they actually see how much there is. And we have this conversation with owners and there's a real um, understatement or, uh, you know, they, they really, their estimates are way off in terms of how much they're throwing out. And I think a lot of people in the audience would, uh, would know that as well, that, uh, you know, you sort of, you query them at the start, um, you know, how much do you think that you're wasting or how much do you think, how much food do you think that you're throwing out? Um, and then you do that first audit. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's pretty alarming. It's pretty illuminating. So yeah, us, by us just separating, um, at the start, I think it, it really does show them. And then we provide a whole bunch of data, uh, to them, uh, and show them what that actually means. So, you know, it's all well and good to say, oh, Hey, you know, uh, we've, we've collected 80, 80 liters of, uh, of food scraps from you today, you know, 30, 30 to 60 kilos of, um, of, of food scraps. And they're like, oh yeah, that seems like a lot, you know, that's the weight of a small person. Um, but then you actually extrapolate that out. Um, and you put, you put some, um, you know, you, you put some other figures towards that, like, you know, how many trees and maybe we could show the, uh, the dashboard that we've got our impact yeah. dashboard. So it's about, it's about making those numbers palatable and approachable. So this is, um, this is our impact report. So what you're seeing here is everything that EcoCaddy's done in this space to date. Um, so the amount of containers that we've collected, uh, every gram uh, of, of food scraps that we've, uh, that we've collected and we do, uh, we also collect volume um, and then CO2 equivalent um, calcs that we, you know, we've, we've gotten from the EPA and a bunch of other sources and then how far we pedaled. So this is one vehicle, um, our prototype vehicle uh, that uh, we're scaling up now. Um, running at, at a very small percentage. Um, uh, you know, we're running at about 10% of, of what it can. Uh, so it's just doing a couple of runs a day. Uh, and yeah, and we, we made a pretty huge impact over about 10 months. Um, and so we then go, okay, well, what does that actually mean in terms of, uh, you know, the number of cars uh, or the number of trees or the number of uh, wind turbines or the number of houses, for instance? Um, you know, so that, that makes it palatable and people are like, oh, you know, wow, that's, um, we've, we've actually done something great here. And, and, and what we want to do with that data is to show them, you know, the amazing things that they're doing and then urge them to do better. So to get back to your original question on this, um, is that we're not a, we don't want to be a waste company because ultimately um, we want to make ourselves redundant in this space and that we don't want there to be uh, any waste or, I mean, it's very hard to, to, to do that, particularly in a food service business, but to minimize waste um, to a point where, you know, we are moving up that hierarchy and hopefully we're diverting things before they get to the bottom, before, you know, the only alternative that we have is to compost. Um, you know, there are a bunch of other things that we can do, um, but really it's a logistics problem. Um, you know, in-time logistics, which is something that we've learned uh, being a delivery business has, has a lot um, to do in this space, which is the circular economy. I think a lot of problems can be solved if we just think smarter about the logistics. Um, you know, that is how do we get one thing from where it gets produced to where it gets consumed to back to where it gets produced. Um, and that's a reverse logistics problem. So that's sort of where we see uh, the future of where we're going. So we don't wanna be a waste company, um, but yeah, ultimately this is where I think we can do uh, a lot of great things, which is, telling the customers how well they're doing, telling them how they can improve and doing that at a high frequency so that we can do it um, uh, incrementally. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so it's not all one big thing that they have to do at the end of the year and they don't have to implement this massive strategy, um, which is costly and time consuming. It's like, what can I do to get to the next step? Um, you know, and how can we incentivize that? Well, one way that we can do that is by showing them the impact um, of their efforts. And so that's, that's where this comes from. Um, so just on that, so those feedback loops are really important and, and I would say that the lack of feedback loops in a, in the conventional model is, is one of the key barriers, People, you know, restaurants aren't getting feedback on 
whether they're correctly sorting their materials, how much how much they're sorting, you know, all those types of things. So with the model that you offer, how often are you reporting to them? Do you report to them in this template that you've just shared? Or is it is it verbally? Like what's what's the process of, of feeding back this information? And, and and also do you do you provide any information on contamination of the food food stream? Yeah, so this is um this is our uh, it is customer facing. It's actually on our website, um, but each of our each of our customers gets a report. Um, they can access that report whenever they want. It gets updated uh, the moment that we come back to the depot and we process uh, their food scraps. So um, it's it's basically a live feed um, of information. Um, but we we provide reports to them on a weekly basis. Um, you know there is information overwhelm as we all know. We're getting notifications you know, all the time from numerous uh, channels. So it's really about finding the right frequency there and uh, mm -hmm. weekly reports, monthly reports, quarterly reports uh, um, are, are the step in the right direction. I think yearly, quarterly is uh, too slow. Yearly is just, um, you know, people look at it and they go, oh, that's fantastic, but they don't actually do anything with it. So um, yeah, the idea of getting it in their hot little hands quicker um, and then providing them information that, is important from the standpoint of improvement. So contamination is one thing that we log. Um, we show them what they've, uh, what they're doing wrong. So what the contaminant is, um, and then the percentage of contamination based on an estimation of, uh, of volume that we're collecting. So um, that then comes through as a visual um, and they can share that at their staff meeting, which is really important. So, you know, it's a PDF, they can show it. They don't even have to print it. Um, you know, think about all the barriers for, for us to change things. Like you can smooth all of that out. Um, and we went through all of them. There are so many and we're like, no wonder no one's changing. No wonder I can't be stuffed composting at home. It's really hard. You know, you really have to learn some stuff and it's, you know, it's, it's easy to set up, which is, I think the case in point here, which is, you know, I think the waste industry is, is set up in a way where, you know, it's sort of a set and forget type scenario where, you know, get the containers out there, onboard the customer, and then, you know, the customer has to do the rest of it. And then that's it. You know, our responsibility is to just go and pick up that bin. We're actually taking more responsibility and we're trying to hold the hand of that customer um, and say, look, we're in this together. Uh, you know, we're going to try our best efforts to, to give you the information and to set you up with a simple system um, so that you're less likely to do the wrong thing um, yeah. and get into these these good patterns of behavior, um, which, you know, then form your baseline, which is just recycling organics, which is just hard enough in itself. And then we can start to talk about harder stuff. You know, you got to learn the ABCs before you can read a book sort of thing. You know, I've got a 22, two month old. So I'm looking at education and learning from, from a whole different light. And it's fascinating. Absolutely. So I'm just, I just, we have some questions from the audience um, that I've just posted in just now. So I think this one you may have already answered, but a question from Rachel Perry, is there an app program you use to generate your impact data? Did you want to speak to that? Uh, we, we built that ourselves. Um, so yeah, we, we see this as something that we want to use right now, but it is something that we're looking at uh, potentially uh, licensing out or providing to the public. Um, yeah, so yeah, there is there's probably ways that you can build simple things yourself using a spreadsheet um and uh and Excel. Excel is pretty powerful. Um but yeah, there is there's a number of other things that we've thought about in terms of how we can get that in the hot little hands of our customers. So um that's about as much as I can share for now. Yeah, for sure. Um and another question from anonymous attendee. <laughs> there's no name associated with that one. Oh um, no. What? <laughs> No. Um, what are the challenges and ways around making sure food waste is sorted properly without contamination or with minimal contamination? Sure. So this is um, this is a really important step for us. Um, and right now we're focusing on accuracy. Um, and our next thing that we're focusing on is throughput um, and then scalability. So right now we're doing everything by hand. Um, and we're, we're processing that ourselves. So we screen it and we take our time screening that so that we can um, ensure that we're getting all the contaminants out before we hand it off to our partners, Pete Soil. Um, and 
Uh, yeah, and then the other thing as well is identifying that contamination so we can categorize it um, and provide that information back to our customers. So the feedback loop um, and the ideal situation, which we've seen um, you know, occur time and time again, is that customers start um, at about two or three percent contamination, and we get them down to way below one percent uh, within you know a month or two, which is okay. fantastic. So if we we can do that without um, you know heavy automation and uh, uh, and you know mechanical sort of yeah machines, um, then that's uh, that's a pretty good system. But right now, all by hand, but it's very important. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you did, you have touched on this throughout the chat, but maybe just for the audience, um, if you could describe what happens after you've collected the food material, I and mean, you mentioned your partner's peat soils, um, can you describe how you move it from where it's collected to, to where, where it ends up? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, like I said, we're in South Australia. We've got two fantastic companies that are already doing a great job. Um, so when we stepped into this space, it was like, oh, well, let's go talk to these guys and um, see what they're doing. Um, and really, um, that's a lateral partnership that we formed with Peach Soil. They obviously um, have the capacity to deal with vast quantities um, of, uh, of material. Um, and so we, we really just didn't want to get held up on that part of, uh, of it. And, and ideally, um, maybe never have to do that part of it because there's already these companies that are doing a fantastic job. That said, um, one of the things that we... Uh, really focusing on is how we can do things more locally. Um, we are, you know, like I said at the start of this talk, we're a last mile, first mile company. Um, so we don't want uh, to be moving things large distances. Um, so we would like to keep things within neighborhoods or, uh, you know, within precincts. Um, so we are doing a little bit uh, of this stuff on site ourselves. So a little bit of composting, experimenting with that, talking with community gardens. Um, talking with schools and seeing how we might be able to uh, plug into that fabric that's already there. Um, and each, uh, each sort of partner that we're looking at has their own uh, sets of challenges. So, um, you know, where can we actually, um, yeah, where can we actually plug in? So it might be in between those things. Um, but yeah, the, the lateral partnerships, I think, is where the, the value in the circular economy really is. So we don't want to overlap. Um, and we don't want to compete where we don't need to. Um, and it's like, okay, well, why, is, why aren't these things happening? Why, why is it that a lot of commercial properties, we are lifting from offices as well, um, and, and food service businesses, why aren't they doing this in the first place? And why aren't those uh, amazing companies in this space? Um, and a lot of it has to do with uh, matching scale, like for like. So there's not a lot of scale coming from each of these addresses where it could signify, you know, a, an opportunity worth going after uh, for for one of these companies, but for us, that's a great that's a great business. Um, and for us, we can actually make that work the unit economics because we have this lean model of collection, um, and this we don't have the same accessibility issues or the same costs uh, to run that infrastructure. So I think it's really matching those things um, where where we can get these amazing um, outcomes for the communities that we serve. So. Um... Putting it in simple terms, do you, you go and collect the food waste from the restaurants um, in your eco caddy? You then cycle to somewhere where you check and sort through the contamination and provide that feedback report to your customer. And then from that point, it gets picked up or something by Pete or your com commercial composting partners to process. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very okay. uh, simple, simple explanation. Yeah, which uh, would probably take me 10 minutes to explain. But yeah, that's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just making That's sure you're the dots. Yeah, the, and, then, and, the yeah and then and then Pete's, Pete's do the conversion, yeah, and turn that into an end product. That's right. Yeah, um, excellent. Yeah, what, what we would like to see, obviously, is, um, you know, some some traceability so that that gets uh, taken, you know, how much of that gets taken to, uh, uh, you know, a farm where that produce is then uh, put back on the plates from our um, from our food service businesses. And so we can sort of prove that closed loop. So... That's a little bit more difficult to do, but we're working on it. Absolutely. Now we've got some more questions coming in from the audience. Um, a question from, from your relationship with businesses, have any mentioned further changes to the way they minimise waste by ordering less, smaller portions and the cost saving benefits they're seeing? Yeah, um, there, is, there is a lot in that space around um, 
I suppose, sustainable consultation um, where, again, these these staff members are overwhelmed with so many other different tasks. And now, you know, we've had a legislation change um, where, you know, now there's no single use plastics and uh, there's a real push for compostable packaging. Um, and there's a, there's a bit of confusion around home compostable, commercial compostable products um, and what can go in which bin. So again, holding the hand of the customer and going, you know, this, this is appropriate, this is not appropriate, um, I think really helps them out in that instance. And then ultimately it helps us um, because then we're not having to spend the time picking this stuff out, right? So I think, um, again, uh, sometimes it makes sense. I think a lot of the times it makes sense to listen to your customer, to hold their hand. Um, you get better outcomes and it reduces costs. You know, it makes you more efficient um, at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Your, the earlier statistic that you shared, reducing contamination from 2 to 3% down to 1%, I'm sure Pete's soils who take that material and compost that would be very pleased with that outcome. Um, yeah. To get <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if they're going to start making a premium product, you know, no plastic. Um, <laughs> yes, certainly. Um, yeah, so it is, yeah, it is. But like, you know, that's, that's what we love about um, really the, the, the end of this loop or the start of the loop, however you want to see it, is that product, uh, the better that product is, the better the food is, you know, the better the nutrient value that comes, uh, that, that goes, that comes out of the soil, that goes into that food. Uh, and what we're talking about from a very holistic, broad view is healthier communities. You know, if people are eating healthier, um, then we become healthier. We're a healthier community. And I think, um, that just lifts uh, the potential of us as a species um, a, a lot higher. So there is that loop, you know, that, you know, if we, if we can do that um, with, with, with how we're sorting that product and making a really good uh, compost product with peats, then um, that's fantastic for everyone. Um, and I've got a question here from Sophie Ward. Is there an issue with the weight of the caddy and needing staff or increased caddy staff to move it? Yeah, some, something that I probably didn't emphasize is that they're electric assisted. So we do have an electric motor on them. Um, they are high torque motors. Um, so they do have the ability to go up uh, almost up to 10%, 8% grade. So we can go up to North Adelaide. We've got a few partners up there. Um, our, think, our caddy riders, sorry? Uh, I think she was talking about the containers themselves, the, with, you know, back of house, the containers with the food waste in them, like lifting them. Oh, sure. Yeah, Oak Health Safety deems that you can't lift anything over 20 kilos. So we've thought about that. Um, and that's why we've gone for three containers rather than just one. Uh, yeah, what, so, yeah. yeah. What's, what's the weight of the container typically if it's full of food? Uh, our, our, heaviest, our heaviest would probably be um, about 16 to 17 kilos when we're lifting out of a cafe, which the mm -hmm. densest material would be, um, you know, damp coffee. That's the densest, heaviest material that comes out of them. Um, T-bone yep. steaks are the other, um, or oyster shells. So yeah, we, yep. we've worked around um, the capacity of that container. Um, and then, you know, we've then pitched it to our, our riders. It's like now it's not only leg day. You're not only getting a leg workout. Now you're getting a full body workout. You know, you're getting, <laughs> getting jacked up here as well, which is, I, I, rode, I rode the first three months for free. Um, if Pete's on the line, Pete Waterwitz, um, you know, I think he was impressed with that, but I got really fit over those three months. There's a, there's a real health benefit to doing this job. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you don't, you don't need to have a gym membership and that's uh that's a real selling point for our, <laughs> for our riders. So. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. There's a lot of uh, spin-off benefits um, by the sounds of it from the service in terms yeah. of health and well-being and, and lower emissions. Mm. Got the, the bikes. Um, so another question here from, from Sandy Mc McCarthy, is compostable packaging of any type acceptable with the food waste collectors? Yeah, anything that's uh, deemed home compostable. Um, because we are giving our stuff off to a uh, commercial um, uh, commercial composter, um, yeah, some of that can be commercial, but we've just said blanket um, home compostable, and it just makes it nice and clear. Um, and that gives us, you know, it doesn't present issues down the line as well. Um, if we want to be doing more composting on site. So we, we have a depot here in the city and um, that's sort of our hub. Um, and so, yeah, we want to be doing more stuff in the Adelaide CBD as well, because we're surrounded by parklands and gardens. And um, so it makes sense to keep the material here too, if we can. 
Um, and we've got a question here from Emily Hendricks. Um, do you have hopes to expand your offering both in terms of location or type of businesses that you're offering services to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I suppose that was the thing that held us back initially was how do we scale? We didn't want to get into a space before we knew we could do that. Um, I suppose we had the advantage that we had a, a business model uh, and an operational model that me, enabled us to scale and we'd, we've already scaled into other cities, uh, sort of on and off in Melbourne, Sydney, going up to Queensland soon. Um, so yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the thing that we really want to work on is how we can uh, operate this in communities um, and sort of hand over the reins to the community rather than us um, operating them. We see uh, compost, food, all that stuff has a real strong connection to community mm. and, um, and to country, to land. Um, so how can we, you know, create uh, employment outcomes, um, which, you know, really, I think, provide that sense of give back um, and people, you know, yeah, I suppose, uh, doing something for their community. I, I really see this as being that. And so, um, yeah, moving away from a centralised model, which I think uh, the waste industry really is centred around, you know, having heavy infrastructure on the outskirts of cities around away from communities because they have to because of odors and all these sorts of things to moving into the heart of communities um, and being the lifeblood of communities. Um, you know, I think that's really uh, where the new world lies is around decentralization. If you, I'm a real tech buff, um, everything's decentralizing. The financial sector is decentralizing transport networks. I'm a transport planner is decentralizing ownership is decentralizing so why not waste infrastructure um oh. so yeah that's that's what we're looking at and then you can scale to anywhere in the world developing countries yeah. that don't have yes. that infrastructure in the first place yeah so you're probably answering my next question daniels because I, I did i was curious to hear your vision for the future of waste management in cities um and you're describing the decentralized um kind of approach to it um can you describe that a little bit more yeah, so, um, I mean, I spent a great deal of time in China um, being an urban designer, working in a place which is sort of like Blade Runner. Sometimes it's a third world country and sometimes it's like even more cutting edge than first world countries. And it's really interesting. They, they invest heavily in infrastructure. Um, but what you see in a lot of third world countries is a lack of infrastructure. And this is what's actually holding back the prosperity of communities. So um, there's great stuff happening in Africa, um, which is the new frontier uh, where they're building infrastructure from the ground up because they're, they're basically leapfrogging um, and they're already moving to decentralized networks. Um, so we're going, well, why get stuck in the past? Why not look to the future? Let's see what's happening in Southeast Asia. Let's see what's happening in Africa where there is chaos, chaotic over there, you know, in Australia. Um, but it's good. It's good to have chaos because that's where you have these amazing outcomes. It's where you have innovation. Um, and here in a very orderly environment like Adelaide, like, we have a grid-like street. We have really, um, we have the toughest regulations in the Western world here um, when it comes to compost standards. And there's good reason for that, as well as transport standards. But that is really inhibiting when it comes to, to innovation. So we're trying to find the best of both worlds, how we can start and scale here in Australia, but where we can really make the greatest impact. And I think that is really overseas, um, you know, in these, uh, in these frontier lands, developing countries. So that's where we hope to be. Fantastic. Yeah, so picking up some of the some of the words that I've heard you talk about today um, and previously. So the future of, of waste management in cities, so being decentralized um, at the human scale. So you talked a lot about scale before and being able to accommodate to different scales. Um, zero emissions because your you know your delivery model is zero emissions. Um, yeah, reducing the impediments, uh, the traffic impediments and, and, and challenges associated with that and, and being more personalised and providing that, that feedback and, and engagement. So yeah, it's interesting, it's interesting. It, it is a change from the traditional commercial um, waste collection models that we do see. Um, something you've talked about as well is, is how your service model is high touch. Um, now, obviously, all these benefits um, probably come at a, an additional cost compared to your conventional realist food waste collections. Um, are you able to share any information on that in terms of, you know, is it much more costly and, and how are customers reacting to that? Um, it's, uh, yes, cost, cost is a very interesting um, 
conversation to have. And it's one that comes up really quickly when you're talking to any customer, you know, how much, you know, this all sounds fantastic, but like how much, um, to marry that with the level of service, um, that they have come to expect is where the real awkward conversation happens, which is, um, they're not used to getting a great, and I'm not trying to, um, offend anyone, but, um, if you think about any bin service anywhere in the country, uh, anywhere in the world, you don't associate a fantastic service with the collection of a bin. Um, you know, basically because you don't really see a human doing most of that. You see, uh, you know, a machine uh, operated by a human, uh, you know, with a mechanical arm in, in Australia and parts of Europe, lifting this thing, um, lifting various ones of them, um, various bins, and then, and then leaving. What we've done is we've actually made it more human centered. We've made it, um, we've made it more approachable um, and we've made, yeah, we've sort of really, I suppose, put it in people's face that, you know, this is, you're not just uh, outsourcing this problem. You know, you're actually handing over your problem. Let's get this straight. You created this problem um, and we're now dealing with this problem, you know? And so it's one of the things which I think a lot of food service businesses um, either underrate or they just don't even take into account the true cost of them doing business. And that's the environmental cost of them doing business. So to have that in a, in a, in a nice way to, to get that into their minds and for them to go, I get it. And a lot of the ones that come to us already understand that. And they're somewhat sickened by the amount, that, the impact they're, that they're making. To go back to that conversation, the staff members are bringing this up going you know why why are we doing this like what are we doing with this stuff so i think that's one thing and so once we qualify that then it's a it's an easier conversation to have around cost and we are a premium service we're not a cheap service and we are a service which we've built it around the cost that it takes to actually do it at the level that we want to do it um mm -hmm. and so that's the conversation that we have it's like we're taking full responsibility of this um, and we're taking some of the, the work that you've had to do to make this service viable. We're doing that. Um, and so that's no longer a cost for you. So we're shifting the cost of a waiter, having to think about that, having to do it, taking a bin out to the curbside, having to reskin a bin, having to clean the bin. We're doing all of that. Do you know how much that's costing you? We've extrapolated that cost. And they're like, oh, wow, we didn't realize that's how much it actually cost us. And so... You know, all of these things is around just making these things transparent and lifting that to the surface when we're having these conversations. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yes, they're willing to pay. They're willing to pay for the cost of the service that they're getting, which is a high touch service. Yeah. It, it's really as though you're flipping the conversation from what's the minimum cost to what value are you providing so rather than just yeah. talking about costs, you're talking about what value are you providing to your business. Correct. Um, yeah. It would be interesting as, as you go forward, um, Daniels, um, with your business and expand, et cetera, if you can get some data on how businesses are reducing their food waste generation um, mm -hmm. because they're becoming more aware of it, as you've described earlier, and, and the potential cost savings to them because what I often find is when you take into account the whole of life costs, or value of, of a certain initiative, the equation changes. Whereas if you're just looking at how much it costs to lift my bin, it, it doesn't really tell the whole picture. So I don't know if that's absolutely you know, in the past, but yeah, yeah I can see that as an opportunity. Um, we have another question from Melanie Agar. Um, have you collected from apartments? Have I collected from what, sorry? Apartments. Apartments is something that we really want to get into. Um, you know, multi-story um, and high-rise high apartments. Um, it's a different kettle of fish. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a less accessible market. Um, and there are obviously higher risks. I think everyone in this audience knows the nuances of getting into this space um, around accessibility um, and around uh, having the relationship with that customer. So there are various technologies um, that we're looking at uh around aggregation how you can do that in basements um but it still doesn't solve a lot of the problems um which again comes down uh or back should i say uh to the responsibility of the person that's generating that waste and so we think that um our approach opens up or unlocks um new opportunities or new potentials um, in that space so 
yes is the short answer. We definitely want to get into apartments. It is a part of our roadmap. It's just not a part of our um, rollout strategy right now. Um, we're, we're really focusing on food service businesses and offices. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, and one of the questions that came in before the webinar started, we had um, people posting questions beforehand. Does your model have global implications? Yes, um, I'd like to think so. Um, you know, everything that we've done to date is not revolutionary. You know, we the title of this talk is new. Um, and I'd like to really sort of zoom in on the new part the new is really how we've reconfigured a whole bunch of things that are out in the wild already um, into a unique way or a unique service model. Um, one that uh, we're really good at naturally. So um, it's not new. A rickshaw is not new. It's 200 years old. It was born in Yokohama, uh, Japan. Uh, and now there's been various iterations of that. It has not evolved anywhere near at the speed of automobiles or trucks. Um, so there is some catch up, but uh, electric vehicles or e-motors on e-bikes and e-trikes is really seeing that exponential curve in innovation. So it does have global implications. Um, and we want to create a model that can be taken globally. Um, you know, it's really around how it's operated, whom it's operated by, um, and the, the accountability of all the actors. So yeah, there's some really exciting technology. What I'm really excited about this space is that it basically touches everyone on the planet. Like, can you, can you think about a business that does that? You think about an industry which touches every person on the planet. Um, every person produces waste. Every, produ every person on the planet uh, consumes food. Um, so, you know, yes, it does have global implications. It touches everyone. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, now, just to touch on another audience question we had, and, and in particular talking about um, developing countries and the application to developing countries. Did you want to speak to that for a little bit? Daniels, in terms of how this yeah. work in that setting? Yeah. Um, look, we're very fortunate in Adelaide to have uh, a very sophisticated uh, infrastructure here. And like, a, like I've kept on saying, like amazing businesses that are, that are solving these problems. Um, and we take a lot of things for granted, which aren't in developing worlds like sewage um, or, you know, access to sewage and access to, uh, uh, to, to, to a bin system, um, which unfortunately ends up in waterways and then it becomes a real health hazard. Um, so there is a real urgency in these regions to solve these problems at a way faster rate uh, than over here. Um, and so that's why I really see, why I'm really looking to places like India, uh, places like Africa, parts of rural China, um, you know, inaccessible uh, parts of, of Europe even, um, and the Middle East where, yeah, really uh, innovation's happening uh, out of necessity, uh, but even still um, access to technology, um, access to experience in this space, um, you know, with these sophisticated systems um, is lacking. So yeah, hopefully um, we continue on our path and uh, we can get over there and hopefully share what we've, we've done. But right now, I think that they're way ahead of us, to be honest. Um, you know, they're they're doing things, uh, they're doing things uh, really efficiently. You know, they have to, um, which is which is amazing. Like to 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 be able to do something on a vehicle like ours, um, there's there's not a lot of margin for error. You know, because you've got a very light vehicle. Uh, you know, you don't have uh, you don't have a lot of extra space. You don't have a lot of extra capacity. So you really need you really need to have your numbers right. Um, and so that's where this whole lean startup model comes from. Uh, but really it's borrowed. And we were having this conversation earlier uh, from India, which is frugal innovation, you know, innovation out of necessity, um, which Silicon Valley's just sort of taken uh, and gone, oh, you know, it's great to have a lean business because then you can get efficiencies and you can make margin and that's how you remain competitive. Um, so, yeah, I think that it sort of goes two ways. Um, one, ho hopefully inspiring the other um, and helping, you know, trying to rise, uh, ro you know, raise the tide of, of all the boats. That's sort of where I see that going. Yeah. And us getting over there as well as getting inspired from over there. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank you for your time, Daniels, and sharing your insights today. Really appreciate it. And thank you very much to the audience. Um, and thank you for all your questions. We didn't 
get time to get to all of them today. Um, but yeah, it, it certainly sparked a lot of interest this topic. And for me, mm. someone who's been working in this sector for over a decade, it, it, it's inspiring to, to see um, a new way of, of collecting food waste. It might not work in all settings, but I think it certainly works in a lot of settings. And I think it, as, as you said, Daniels, it's bringing together a whole bunch of old things and bringing them together in a, in a new way um, to overcome some of some of the challenges that we see when it comes to to the, the, the livability and the amenity of our cities, our, our traffic systems, mm. um, getting good outcomes for um, recycling rates and and reducing contamination, as well as providing that feedback loop to reduce food waste, as well as partnering with um, quality organisations like like Pete's to make sure that that food waste is, is turned back into compost. So thank you so much for your time, Daniels. Um, thank you, Kat. Thanks for all the amazing questions, everyone. Right. <laughs> and I'll hand you back to Sleeper. Thank you, Viaf. Thank you, Daniels. And uh, th thank you for your time, first of all, Kat and Daniels. And thanks a lot to the audience. I think uh, been pretty engaged through the conversation. So that speaks a lot to the model in itself, I guess. So, uh, and uh, just a reminder to the, uh, the audience that this webinar is going to be available for you to watch on demand uh, on Zoom itself. In two weeks, we will put this up on our website and uh, it'll be accessible to all then. Thanks a lot. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.